Continue here. All right, we finished. Now, under the training materials that we talked about last week is where I'm getting all these PDFs from, okay? Now, next week, Shalon will cover some more, but we're also going to have the image ready for you all to go fix stuff, okay? So next weekend, come here, and basically you'll be doing the stuff we just talked about, okay? Similar to what you do in the competition, but we're going to be making an image this week that has issues with it, and you're going to be fixing it next week, okay? Are we okay with that? Okay. And we can take it home. You can take it home, yes. It'll be the same thing. It'll be a 7-zip image you can take home and play again. So, all right? Roy, can you hear me over there? Yep. Okay. All right. So let's do the next set of slides, threats and vulnerabilities. All right, any questions before we start? Everybody happy? Everybody have enough pizza? I think we went from way too little to way too much. I think there was almost a, two pizzas. I don't know. It was what two people per pizza this time or something? Well, okay, let's continue. All right, threats and vulnerabilities. We're going to talk about what they mean first. We're going to talk about some different threats. But we'll talk about some examples. Then we're going to do how you get infected. Well, I think it's called Facebook. Uh, <laughs> we've done then some prevention. Okay. All right. Um, I would say it ver we usually have at least once a week we have someone bringing virus. Infected computer into my office, so it's crazy the amount of people that have them on there. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about what these are. Some more definitions here. Everybody see that? Okay. All right. A threat is any circumstance or event with the potential to adversely impact operations, including mission functions, image or repudiation, assets or individuals through an information system via unauthorized access, distribution, disclosure, modification of information, and/or denial of service. Wow, that says a lot. Basically, it can be anything that affects you in some way we can't do what you're supposed to be doing. Okay? It could be infecting your machine. could be that whole – remember we talked about CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. could be denial of service affecting our availability. Confidentiality, maybe, maybe someone you know, letting the word out on something. It's a, all kinds of different things. Okay, so threats could be anything. They could be people. They could be software. They could be environmental. Okay. Um, haven't any real bad. But we didn't. We have many tornadoes this year. We didn't, did we? We didn't have that many. But a couple of years ago, we actually had a tornado that, that ruined part of the build. One of the buildings here at Rose State. So, you know, I get a roof replaced almost every year because I get hail damage every year. So that would be a threat. So, look, I don't have to pay for it. That's good. Okay. So threats could be anything. Okay. To adversely impact operations, usage, assets, anything. Okay. So having a guest account with no password on it enabled, is that a, a threat? Yeah, because someone could get in and do stuff to it. Okay, Accessing unauthorized websites on your work computer, what do you think? Is that good? Probably not either because you could be installing stuff you're not supposed to be installing. So if we start using administrator accounts, okay, give everybody administrator accounts, then they can start installing all kinds of stuff they're not supposed to be doing. That could be an issue. Maybe you're... Your work doesn't allow you to use USB drives. So anything like that can be an issue. Now here, Rose, we not as big a deal. Okay. Now let's talk about vulnerability. So weakness in an information system. It could be um, system security procedures, internal controls, or implementation that could be exploited or triggered by a threat source. So maybe we don't have a password policy here. Is that a good idea? Probably not. If we don't have a pa so if we never require you to change your password. What are some of the issues with that? Anybody? Never require you to change your password. Well, anyone can start breaking into it. I mean, they, I mean, it's once they get access to it, they can have your password forever. What was it, LinkedIn or someone got a whole bunch of passwords stolen? Six point five million passwords recently. So passwords is a big issue. Um, so procedures. How about training? Could training be an issue? Should we be training our employees that work on our computers? Definitely, we should. Okay. We all, like at Rose State, we have a sexual harassment training. And whenever I have to go through something like that, yes. The older people should have all gone through sexual harassment training. It's kind of funny because they required all of us to do it. It was all on the web. And the cool thing was if you went through it, selected any answer, then hit the next arrow, it told you the correct answers. 
Then you hit the back arrow, put in the correct answers, they hit the next arrow, and you double the whole thing in five minutes. Probably not what they intended for the training, <laughs> but um, <laughs> not that I did that. I just found the vulnerability. So, uh, all right, but vulnerabilities, it could be all kinds of stuff, all kinds. Okay. How about, you know, we got a network port. Each one of you plugged into a network port with our computers. And we also have wireless here at Rose. Could that be a vulnerability? Yes, it could. Um, you know, someone could just be plugging laptops into network ports that aren't left enabled. Someone could use them the wireless that's not supposed to be. There could be all kinds of issues with that. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> all right, malicious software, also known as malware. So much of it. Now, if I was to start surfing the web, and I found something called the uh, butterfly screensavers for free, and I install them, what do you think? Could that be an issue? Could be. I have so many people say, but it was free. Okay. I don't know if you're all old enough to know this yet, but there is nothing in life that is free. Nothing. Nothing is free. There's always a cost. So by downloading the Butterfly screensavers, if you, I had a friend who installed it multiple times and drove me crazy. And they're like, but it's so pretty. I'm like, okay, first of all, you're supposed to be using your computer to work. So if the screensaver's on, you're not working. So, I mean, anyone see an issue with that? Okay. So, but uh, it was actually distributed by Gain Publishing. Hmm. Yeah. And what they were doing is when you installed it, installed all this other spyware as well. And what would happen is once you install it, then all of a sudden, say you're going to look for a new phone on AT&T. Type in AT&T.com, it popped up, hey, you're looking for a phone? Why not go to Sprint? That kind of stuff. It would actually look at what you're doing and offer you other advantages, you know, other things that they make money off of. That, oh, it's crazy. All right. So malware, software designed and written to annoy us. I hate that. Drives me crazy. Okay. Steal information from computer or spy on the user. Maybe they're just tracking what you're doing. How much do you think it'd be worth, you know, if if someone could tell exactly what every user at Rose State was serving? Would somebody be willing to pay for that? Sure they would. They always want to know what you're doing. It's kind of like you go to Amazon and you search for something. The next time you go to Amazon, it's amazing. They're offering all this stuff that's very similar to what you just searched for. Okay. So, all right. So, steal information. Gain control of a computer. Maybe they're actually getting into your computer and using it. Okay. I, did I talk about Ghost Exodus in here? Did I mention him at all? Let me show you this. Um, there's a G... Uh, see if I can't find it. Um, Ghost Exodus. Okay, <clears throat> he's sentenced to nine years and two months. But Grew Security I actually went to a conference where this guy spoke. And he talks about Ghost Exodus. Ghost Exodus broke into. I mean, there's videos on you. They actually he actually posted a video of himself breaking into computers. I mean, he actually had a laptop walking around the building. All right, this is Ghost Exodus. I'm infiltrating the place. I mean, you can see his face. I mean, he had a security guard clothes on. He worked for the company is what it was. So, all right, now I'm going to use this top secret key, and it's a security key because he's a security guard. Accesses a room, and he plants a software on a computer. But it, if you want to get, you know, see what it looks like from the bad guy, search for Ghost Exodus, and McGrew Security is an instructor who poses as a bad guy, and he infiltrates these guys. But what he does is he actually works for a... Um, hospital type place where they have drugs and stuff that have to be refrigerated. Well, they install a botnet, which is a piece of software that connects out that allows them to control your machine. But he installs that, and the reason they got in big trouble was he did it at a hospital, and they were installing on a system that had access to the air conditioning system. Can you imagine if they took all that offline, that all the drugs and everything would start going bad? But Ghost Exodus is really kind of cool. You can go on here. You can watch all the videos about it. It's really, it's really kind of cool. But he, the video he posted on YouTube, he had the Mission Impossible music in the background. He's got his, his hood up there. All right, just Ghost Exodus. I'm infiltrating the area, and it's, it's really, really funny. All right, but then he did that so they could gain access to a computer. And the funny thing about it is, to prosecute him, they had to prove that he did it to a specific machine. And if you, when you watch the video, hopefully you'll go watch it. It's too long to show in here. But the computer he gets into has a purple um, or pink uh, flamingo, one of those little teeny ones, stuck on the top of the monitor. 
And when the, when he's got the camera showing what he's doing to the computer, you can see that pink flamingo thing stuck on the monitor. And that's how they proved it was that specific machine that he broke into. And what he did is he goes into the machine, because they leave it logged on. He goes into the machine, disables the antivirus, installs its botnet, activates it, and then starts controlling the machine remotely. So it's really kind of cool. It's called Ghost Access. You need to watch that. Okay. So gain to control of a computer, destroy or corrupt information or computer software. They begin to destroy someone's work. Imagine someone's working on stuff for years. Uh, I was, um, I forget where I heard about this, but there was a school who uh, it was one big school, like MIT. It wasn't MIT, but it was one of those big schools. It was posting all their research. They, they basically have access. All the research is free. Well, I think it was Berkeley. It was one of those big schools. But they basically said all their stuff is free. They don't care about security because they're an open system. They want to show but what they didn't realize was they were actually posting the stuff that failed. Okay. Why would they be of use of any? Why would they post results of research that failed? Imagine if you get access to the results of the research that failed, now you know what not to do. So, I mean, it was really, there's a big article about that. There's just all kinds of stuff. People, you don't think of what people can do with your information. Okay. So it says categorized by type, how malware spreads, and by malicious. We're going to talk about that. Okay. Let's talk about the different types of malware. Could be a virus, could be a worm, could be a trojan. Okay. Multiple different things. Okay. Virus is a computer virus, a software program capable of reproducing itself and usually capable of causing great harm to files or other programs on the computer. A true virus in red now, normally red, bold, italic kind of means important. A virus cannot spread to another computer without human assistance. Somehow you need to click on something, install something, run something to get a virus. Okay? If I have a virus on this, it's just not going to do it by itself. You need to execute it or something. You need to open the email, click on the link on a website. you got to do something. Okay? So it's the oldest type of malware known for affecting yourself or other programs. Uh, I uh, had to clean the um, oh, uh, NIMDA virus. Some of you might have heard the NIMDA virus. It was actually admin backwards. The NIMDA virus years ago. And it, it spread through email. It was actually a virus and worm kind of combination together. And I spent hours and hours cleaning that. I went actually went to a, an estate sale company that sold estates when people were dying or someone wants to sell their estates. But I was out there cleaning their whole network. I turned, off, turned the whole network off. I had to go PC to the PC to clean them. But I wasn't quite done. Okay, So the owner comes in. Early the next morning before I get there, turns the whole network back on. It all make a replicates and affects all the machines all over again. I was so depressed. Oh, it just I mean they did pay me by the hour, but sometimes money is just not enough. Okay. But there's information more about viruses there. Okay. So how do you get infected? Could be through an email. Do you just randomly open all emails you get, even if you don't have a clue where they're coming from? Yeah. <laughs> you should never I mean, open an email that you don't know who it's coming from. Okay. Uh, I was at the Apple store or AT&T store yesterday. I had to call my son because it was a phone he wanted and they had. So I tried calling him, but they were upgrading my phone, so I couldn't call him from my phone, so I had to use the, the guy, the, the worker's phone. My son wouldn't answer. Does he want to answer a phone list? He knows who it is. Drives me crazy. So if I ever call him from a number that's not mine, he won't answer. But that's really a good policy. Don't open an email from someone you don't know. Now, me teaching here is kind of hard because I always get emails from people I don't know. But does that mean I open every attachment that's inside the email and start clicking on it? No. Okay. Could be a malicious website or link. A lot of that stuff on Facebook, I think that was one of the biggest places to get junk lately. It was crazy. So be careful with those links. Download a share program medium, adopting file. Maybe you uh, are running BitTorrent of some form or another and you're downloading all kinds of stuff. Just because it says it's the newest song on the market, doesn't necessarily mean it's the newest song on the market. It could be anything. Okay. All right. The I love you virus. Oh, wow. This one was tough. Uh, <laughs> it was tough because I took care of a company, uh, Teller Valve Technologies, at the time this virus came out. They got infected. Obviously, they were one of the 45 million. They paid me 100 bucks an hour to clean it, so I really shouldn't be complaining. But um, the issue was they'd keep clicking on it. And the good thing about the I love you virus is it was easy to fix. It affected certain files, and you knew exactly which ones they were, so you could go in and do it. So I, you know, they call, oh, Ken, I actually clicked on that email again. 
So I go clean it. No, nope. I actually clicked on it again. If I said, dude, no one loves you, just stop clicking on these emails. <laughs> what that actually did was it would go through your email box, it would go through your contact list, and send emails out as you to other people. So it would go through your whole contact list and tell everybody you love them. And then you'd click on that, and then it would start infecting them, and then go through their box. So that's how it kept replicating. So what I ended up doing was I opened the VBS file, figured out what it did, I wrote them a batch file, a little script to run, that I just put on the desktop of every machine. So next time you're infected, you click this batch file, and it totally cleans it off again. And, but you wouldn't believe how many people click on something that says, I love you. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. And they do it multiple times. It's crazy. That was one of the, I don't know, I, I definitely remember that one. Get okay, worm. A computer worm is a program which copies itself across the network. Okay? A computer worm differs from a virus, and then it can run by itself. Okay? doesn't need to be executed. It could actually replicate itself. A virus needs a, a host or program to run, and the virus code is part of the host program. A worm can spread without a host program, although some modern computer worms also will hide in files, but you know, for the most part, they can go by themselves. And they usually spread quicker because they don't need anyone to execute them. A virus, if I'm sending you a virus, first of all, you're all going to have to execute the virus before it can start spreading. Then whoever you send it to is going to have to execute it. But a worm, if I send it to you, it automatically infects you. Then automatically keeps going out infecting everybody in the system. Okay. The Sasser worm infected one, more than one million computers. It shut down satellite communications. Infected the Britain's Coast Guard. Uh, it infected Delta Airlines. Uh, whole bunches of companies. Uh, just tons of them. Bank financial networks. Hospital X-ray machines. Just amazing. But, yeah, and there's just a whole bunch of stuff. It says estimated damage of hundreds of millions of dollars. How do they estimate all these damages? Like the I Love You a couple of screens ago? 45 or 10, 10 billion hours. How do they go with that? How much are they charging you to fix it? Right. How much does it cost to fix the darn thing? If I'm charging 100 bucks an hour, what do you think some of these other places are charging? A lot more than that. So, and also the downtime. Say Andrew's machine over there is infected. He can't do no work, so he's sitting there playing solitaire. So not not only are they paying me to clean it, but also paying him to sit on his butt and do nothing while I clean it. Okay? Kind of scary, okay? All right, exploited a network vulnerability and did not use email. It went through network vulnerabilities. A lot of them go through shares, stuff like that. All right, how do you get infected? It could be a vulnerable operating system. I think it was actually in the I Internet Explorer update this week. Wasn't the one that I read something about that? I didn't install it. I don't use IE anymore, or very seldom. But there was a vulnerability that came out this week, and they actually had what's called a zero day of vulnerability. What or zero day? What that is is we we got a problem. We know what the problem is. We just haven't fixed it yet. And the problem is they tell the whole world about it. Someone finds a vulnerability and says, "Hey, I found a problem with that door." It won't latch. So we tell the entire world about it. Now the whole world knows about that door won't latch, and that takes a couple days to fix it. That's what happens with zero day. They tell the whole world about a vulnerability, and people don't have the time to fix the vulnerability. before. So in other words, you need to, you know, it's tough. It, that, that time period is tough. Okay? Could come through an email attachment. Could be malicious link again. Could be a download or share program, media or document file. Okay. It drives me crazy now, but every time you open anything like PowerPoint, Excel, if you have one that has like automated stuff built into it, none of it will run anymore because they disable all that stuff because of those old, um, whatever they're called, those old macroviruses. Macro viruses. That's what I was looking for. There's a whole bunch of macroviruses out there that the moment you opened it, automatically executed. So that's just all the same. Anyone ever notice uh, even Gmail and Outlook and all them disable pictures by default? You have to click on and say, show me the pictures. Because they don't want to show you anything anymore. They want to disable everything, which is better. It's more secure. Okay. Oh, the, the I love you virus. I was actually working here at the time. And I remember that computers on campus kept getting infected. Even after, you know, a while later, they would actually have to turn the email program off for a short, I, I don't know, years ago now. But I remember getting an email saying, the email's going down to 3 p.m. today to clean the I love you virus. Well, what happened is it was, People get infected, and then obviously would email to everybody else. So they turn off the mail server so they can go clean all the PCs before they turn the mail server back on. So it happens everywhere. Okay. 
Trojans, a computer program that appears to have a useful function. Oh, like butterfly screensavers. Okay. Also have a hidden or potential function that evades security mechanisms sometimes by exploiting legitimate author authorizations or system entities invoking the program. That what happens is you install something and it does something else as well, just like I talked about. All right. How do I get infected with a Trojan? I could download something. It could be a shared program. It could be a document file. It could be through P2P, through BitTorrent, LimeWire, whatever. What is the current P2P program out there other than BitTorrent? Is there anything else? The donkey, I think, might uh, still be around. So LimeWire is gone. Kazaa is gone too, isn't it? Kazaa used to be out there, and BearShare was out there. I don't know. Wasn't Morpheus or something? Another one? There's a bunch of them. I know a lot of them are shut down. Okay. Could be peer to peer. Could be downloading an email attachment. Okay. Could be a fake software download. A lot of times you click on something. Oh, I want to install this. No, don't. All right. Here's a Trojan example. Oh, these are just wonderful. They come up and they say, hey, you're infected with all these viruses. You'll get like Windows 7 Security Essentials Pro or something. Okay. Basically here it says you have 22 threats. What happens, they pop up, and they this is really just an animated graphic at this point, telling you, hey, you got all these issues. The moment you start clicking on it, that's when you get infected. Just by seeing this on your screen doesn't mean you're infected. If you get this, turn the machine off. One of my old clients, Aerospace Reports, what was kind of cool about them is if I told them something, they would do it. And they were kept getting infected. So I finally went to every employee at the place and said, you know, if you get anything like this, don't touch it. Don't click. Don't nothing. And they actually got the point. They'd call me, Kent, I got on my screen again. I haven't touched a single key, which is great. I could get in remotely and clean it. But the moment you start clicking these buttons, you know, it's bad. Okay? By clicking the remove all button right there, you're installing something. Then what's going to happen is it's going to install something. Then a couple of days later, it's going to say, hey, You've got a virus I can't remove. You can have to pay me twenty nine ninety nine to remove it. So you can upgrade to the pro edition. So you can upgrade to their pro edition of bogus virus, and then they're getting some money from you. Then a couple months later, hey, now we got an expanded pro edition. It's even going to do something else. I actually had a student who bought it twice. That was the Linda factor. She actually bought it. Bought it the second time. Then came to us complaining after the second time that it wasn't removing everything. They wanted her to buy it again. I'm like, well, you actually bought this? Because yeah, I bought it and I brought the pro upgrade. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Don't ever do that. So it says antivirus is promoted through the use of trojans that come mostly as fake online anti-malware scanners like this. You're gonna click it to clean your system. Okay. All right, malicious activity. There's many different kinds. It says some malware simply destroys information. Uh, we actually had a machine the other day. I still don't know how it happened, but her machine totally died. She said she was up looking at a website for missing and exploited children, which is probably totally acceptable. But she clicked on some instantly the machine totally died. And she brought it to Best Buy, and they said, we can't get nothing from you, nothing whatsoever. So, she, And I guess it was one she uses for work, so her work was really upset that all this stuff is now gone. So she brought it to us, and we were actually able to retrieve everything. I still don't know exactly what it was, but we retrieved all our data. And the funny thing was, she, we called her, she said, yep, we got all your data back. Everything's recovered. She's like, oh, did you look at it? I'm like, why? Well, there's, she goes, there's a lot of personal information on there. I'm like, like we had not looked at it, but, you know, so be careful. You ever bring your machine to Best Buy or something? You got something on that you don't want them to know about, they can find it. But yeah, we were able to get all our stuff back. But it corrupted the drive where it wouldn't even, even Windows didn't even see it as a drive anymore. So the drive is corrupt, got a format. Don't ever do it. We can always get the data back. Not always, but a lot of times. Okay. So they could destroy information. They could allow other people to get into your system. Okay. Back doors. Okay. That's, yeah, you know, I actually wrote some software way back when I was in the military. Um, you know, I basically got moved into the computer field because I fixed some kernel's computer. So they put me in the computer field, and then I saw the, the people, the secretaries in our office doing some repetitive stuff that took forever. So I actually wrote a computer program for them. This is back before I had a lot of training. I, I wrote a computer program for them. They loved it. They used it. But to make it easier in case they ever screwed up something, I put a backdoor into it. 
So if you log in with a certain account, it just bypasses all security and put me right in there to fix it. Is that a good idea? <laughs> it was awesome at the time. It was great for me to fix it, but the, you know, to think about it, it's really not a good idea. Backdoor is where someone puts a backdoor in, a way to get in. Okay? You shouldn't have those. Could be remote access, could be remote administrative tools, all kinds of stuff. Okay. Um, I assigned a, a project in forensics the other day, or advanced forensics. We're using a piece of software called NCase. NCase is a forensics piece of software that can recover data, do all kinds of stuff. And a friend of mine installed it, and then his antivirus popped up, says, "Warning: Possible, you know, malicious software is being installed." It was that NCase program, but uh, yeah, it was okay. But it was. Funny that that was recognized as that. Could be a logic or time bomb. Maybe something's going to happen at a certain time. Was it the Melissa virus that was linked to time? It was one linked to somebody's birthday. I forget who it was. But maybe we can set up something that once can do is remove from the system, wipe the system. That way if I ever get fired, it keeps checking if the can do account's still there, and as long as I'm there, I'm okay. If they ever fire me, it could go delete it. That could be one way. Could be a key logger. Last time I did a little presentation on spyware, I was looking at keyloggers. And they were saying like 94% of all spyware out there includes keyloggers. Does that mean they're capturing my keystrokes? No, it means they have the capability to, though. Okay. Keyloggers could be just capturing anything you type. Okay. I actually, I don't think I still have it with me. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I know those of you online can't see this, but I was uh, in the classroom over here the other day, room 214. And the network cable is unplugged. So I went to plug it in. I noticed this little, it looks like it comes from a Polaroid camera. I'm not sure if it does or not. This is on the back of the computer in the classroom. I didn't put it there. It shouldn't be there. This could have been a keylogger for all I know. I yanked it off. No one's come asking me for it yet. I still don't know what it's for. But they're so teeny. This fits in a USB drive. It's teeny tiny. Could be a key. I could walk by your machine, stick this in the back of your machine, come back a month later and pick it up. So you, you don't know why anyone's got a Polaroid, do you? Hey, Roy, you don't know anything about a Polaroid thing being in 214, do you? Nope. Okay, well, it was in that machine I got if someone's looking for it. All right, so it could be a keylogger. It could be spyware and adware. Adware is, again, you, you're searching for AT&T. It brings up Singular or Sprint or somebody or stuff like that. They want to make you spend money. Okay, back to us. An entry point to a program that the program leaves itself in order to gain quick access without having to go through all the normal built-in checks. That's what I did. I could log in a certain way, instantly I got in so I could fix stuff. It says, in theory, the backdoors are taken out on the final release, but they're usually not. They would ever notice that most of Google's software is in beta? A lot of times Google's always in beta. Why is it always in beta? That way they can always say, oh, well, we weren't quite done with it yet. Yeah. Hey, makes sense. But, uh, all right. It's generally considered to be a program that has been placed on a computer, usually super Whatever. Surreptitiously. Yeah, that word. Okay. <laughs> that Surreptitiously. There you go. It allows the user to gain malicious, complete, or administrative, basically take over the machine. Okay. Not always a good thing. Okay. All right. Here's an example. The Energizer Dual USB Charger software allows unauthorized remote system access. Actually, I'm thinking about that. Uh, was it last week? It was a bunch of laptops sold in China that had a backdoor built into them. The, someone in the manufacturer line, they installed this backdoor on it, and they're trying to say it was a flaw in Windows, but it wasn't. It was something people installed in the manufacturing process. It was scary. Okay. So this software says the modern software contains road code that listens for commands on a certain port and can download executable files, transmit them over PC, or tweak the Windows registry. Even after unplugging it, it executes every time you turn the PC on. There you go. Don't ever buy that. But did the, you think the manufacturer knew that was on there? Probably not. Someone along the manufacturing process probably installed it. Okay. A logic is a program or a portion of the program which lies dormant until a specific piece of program logic is activated. Okay. Uh, could be you no know, time or anything. Okay? It's like we talked about already. So all right. it could be based on data time. It's always called a time bomb. Okay. Here's a logic bomb. It says, X Fannie Mae employee accused of planting computer time bomb. Computer engineer employee fired from troubled mortgage giant Fannie Mae is accused of preparing a malicious computer time bomb which it will not that which it has not been detected might have destroyed millions of files across the network. So 
So pretty scary stuff. How about the uh, Stuxnet virus? Did y'all hear about that one? One affected Iran nuclear power. You know, it was actually done by the U.S. Isn't that awesome? I knew it was. The moment I heard about that, I said, it has to be done by the U.S. Everybody said, no, it came from China. No, it was all U.S. stuff. That was kind of the same kind of thing. But, all right. Keylogger are applications or pieces of the hardware that monitor a keystroke and then sends them back to a malicious user or stores them. Okay, it can happen via email. Actually, let's go see if we can find a picture of a keylogger real quick. I bet we can find one. Yeah, they come in big pieces there. They come in PS2. Uh, there's a USB one on the right over there. Just plugs into the USB port. All kinds of stuff they can have on there. Look how small they are. Yeah. All kinds of them out there. All right. So it could be hardware. could be a piece of software. Now, an old client of mine had me install some software that monitored everything on the PCs in the building. What do you think? Is that good or bad? Well, right. She's got a very valid point. Now, the owner specifically bought this software and had me install it on specific machines that weren't doing work, that seems like they were always doing something else, and it gave them the ability to see everything they were doing. Now, that's actually a very touchy point. Now, they all have to sign a policy that says, you know, the owners have the right to do whatever they feel like with everything and monitor you and everything. So normally that's not such a good idea anymore because people are going to court and saying that, hey, they were watching what I was doing, but I did it because they were the owners. It was their software, and the person they were basically using it against wasn't working. They were actually doing other stuff, and they should be working. So, All right. Keylogger examples. The United Nations hit by Keylogger and Trojan attack. There you go. There's a big article about that. Okay, it says a keylogger and Trojan were downloaded to visitor computers flagged by an online scanner as positive uh, for multiple Microsoft vulnerabilities that were hidden in the Java framework. Nice. All right. Other uses for keyloggers. System administrators can use them. It says keyloggers will help you find out what took place on the systems in your absence. So there are good uses for this. Okay. Office managers may want to monitor people. Okay. I, I talked about what they did. Parental monitoring. Maybe you want to see what your kids are doing. Okay. Personal use, be able to find out what is being done on your PC in your absence. Uh, I used to have Vonage. You, wanna, you know what Vonage is? It's a voice over IP. It's where you use the internet to make phone calls. I loved it. It was great. Uh, but I wasn't using it that much for phone calls. So but I switched to a lower plan where I didn't have unlimited. And then I got the bill the next month, and my bill was like $50 higher. And I'm like, what the heck? Why does my bill go up by 50 bucks? I barely made any phone calls at all. Well, it turned out we had a cleaning lady. I had cameras put in my house. We had a cleaning lady. She'd come into my house. First thing she did was grab the phone, dial someone. The entire time she was cleaning my house, she was on the phone. So, yeah, we took care of that pretty quickly. <laughs> so I was kind of modern what she was doing. But... Could be Internet Cafe. Kilo says you find out what users have been doing on the computers. But you got to be careful about that. Can you imagine installing the keylogger in an internet cafe, then you're capturing everybody's usernames and passwords and all kinds of stuff? might sound like fun, but it actually is an evasion of privacy. You could get in trouble for that. Being held liable for damages. Yeah, you could be, yeah, all kinds of problems. Now, I guess you could tell them up front, but come on, if you're telling me, Ken, I will be monitoring every keystroke you type in, I will not be using your computer. <laughs> okay. All right. Spyware. Spyware is a computer software that gathers information about a computer user, such as browsing patterns. We talked about that. Credit card numbers and transmits them to other people without the informed consent. Okay. Adware. Advertise support of software where the advertisements are displayed when the program is running. Um, again, I took care of Philip Neri over here, and uh, I had a call from the principal one day. Her name was Betty. She's an awesome lady. Principal of the Catholic school. You never meet a better person in your life. She calls me one day and says, Ken, you know, I got some pop-ups on my screen. They won't go away. She goes, no rush. Just when you get a chance, come over. So what does that mean? Should I stop what I'm doing and run over there immediately? Eh, it means, you know, it's no rush. Just come over the next couple days. Well, she was a principal, so she always had the kids in there on timeout and everything had to sit in her office. She always had meetings in her office. Well, it turns out she had pornography popping up. 
So I go there, and all this porn's popping up. I'm like, whoa, why didn't you tell me what was this? But Because I mean, I ended up rebuilding her machine, but I was like, that kind of was an important thing. Principal, the kids in the office got pornography popping up. It wasn't the best option there. But anything can happen. Anything can happen. So I immediately fixed it at that point. I'm like, she goes, yeah, it wasn't that big a deal. She says, yeah, you probably had kids causing problems so they would get put in your office. Oh, she's got porn in there. <laughs> but it was, oh, it was terrible. All right. But they display ads, they display pop-up windows, all that kind of stuff. Okay. It says, how are compromised used? They could be used as a zombie. Okay. I recommend you go watch that Ghost of Exodus video because that's what he did. He set up as a zombie to be controlled. Computers are compromised computers under the control of an attacker. The zombie's computer can be part of a botnet. So if you get a chance, go watch that. It's about an hour long. I think there's a couple different videos. Okay. A botnet is a collection of networked or compromised computers under the control of an attacker. What happens is say I installed a botnet or a zombie on each one of these PCs in this room. Then I could remotely control them. An example of that, and I wonder if it's SETI at home. Where you're breaking codes and stuff like that, and there's also folding at home, which actually solves something with that. But that's kind of the same thing, but that's legitimate uses for it. Yes. So whenever the attack went out on the poker website, it's like whenever they did the botnet across right. the all the poker users, users. right? Uh, yes. Yeah. What happens is you get it installed on your machine. So basically, everybody that used whatever that poker stars, whatever website that was, they probably get it installed. Then somebody could actually use your computer. Because are you like right now? We're all sitting here at these computers. Are we actually using them to their fullest potential? No. So they actually could be doing something in the background. That's what that study at home does. It helps look for extraterrestrial life and stuff like that. We actually had a, I was. A, Monitoring the room 214, I was installing ISA, Internet, uh, I, whatever, from Microsoft. It was proxy zero, now it's ISA server. But I was looking at the network in room 211 and 214, and I saw all this traffic. And it was like a Friday afternoon. Like, we have no students here, no classes going around. Why do I have all this traffic? Well, it turns out one of our adjuncts, with my permission that I totally forgot about, had installed SETI at home on all the machines in that room. And when they weren't being used, it would download and perform all these calculations and find stuff. So there's legitimate uses for this. You can actually go on Russian websites and buy botnets. It's like pennies per machine. You tell them how many how many connections you want, what do you want them to do. You pay them money and they'll just use them. Happens all the time. All right. <clears throat> so here's a botnet. We have some attacker controlling all these PCs all over the world, making them go out and attack somebody else. All right, how are they used? It could be a denial of service. So if all of your machines started attacking my machine, you think my machine would run a little bit slower? Yes. Yeah. What if instead of just 28 of you, what if I had 10,000 people attacking me? I'm pretty much dead. That's called denial of service. It takes me offline. It says deny access to computer or its information by consuming resources. It could be the CPU, the memory, or the, the network. Um, if you know anything about TCP IP, it actually – that's what's called a three-way handshake. Okay, I call Andrew. I said, hey, Andrew, I want to talk to you. And his computer says, all right, Ken, and I want to talk to you too. And I say, okay, good, let's talk. So we make a three-way connection. Then we start talking. Okay. Well, there's actually something called a sin flood attack where I could say, hey, Andrew, I want to talk to you. And then he says, okay, Ken, and I never say another word. So for the next 10 minutes, Andrew's sitting there saying, hello, Ken, are you there? Ken, are you there? It's actually the default timeout is 10 minutes. So imagine if a million computers connected into me and all said, hey, Ken, we want to talk to you. And then never said another word. I'd be like, hello, hello, you all there? And I'd be trying to answer a million people. I wouldn't get any work done. It would be terrible. So that's pretty much what it is. Distributed denial service, that's where it's distributed against, against multiple computers on a botnet, kind of like the picture. There's also spam, unwanted or unsolicited email. Okay. Uh, I was doing a whole bunch of research on spam for my PhD, and I, whenever I ran my ISP, I was actually looking at how much spam's out. How, what do you think the percentage is of spam concern, you know, compared to real email? Anybody? It was like 93 or 94 percent last time I checked. What I did is I went out and made some brand new email accounts. 
and go to like one website. Then it was amazing the amount of spam I'd get from them because what happens is they would sell it. It was just, oh, it was just amazing. Okay, so spam, unwanted or unsolicited in email. What's the best way to get rid of spam, anybody? Have some sort of filtering system is really the best. But if I get some spam, should I really reply and please remove me and stop sending me this junk? That's a bad idea. A really bad idea. What I, t what I tell people is, imagine you're at your house and you get a JCPenney flyer in the mail. Are you going to call up JCPenney and tell them to stop sending it to you? No, you're going to throw it in a trash can. That's let them just delete the spam. Because so what happens is they send out spam to every name they can possibly think of, and they're waiting for you to reply. The moment you reply and say, please remove me, they're like, I got one, then they sell your name. So instead of removing you, they're actually adding you to a whole bunch of other lists at that point. So if you get spam, delete it. Now, if it's something you specifically knew, yes, ma'am. Oh, nice. That's why you should never put your cell phone number anywhere. Okay. But now, if you're getting emails from companies that you subscribe to, yeah, then you can tell them to, like, I don't know, something I bought the other day. I started getting emails from them. Hey, we also got this. I said, you know, please stop sending me. Because that was something I initiated. So I knew it was legit. Okay. All right. Denial of service examples. In February 2000, leading websites under attack from a denial of service. Big name companies such as Yahoo, Buy.com, also eBay. We're down for up to three hours. Okay, right, Yahoo's down for three hours, buy.com three hours, eBay, hour and a half, CNN, 110 minutes, Amazon, one hour. Can you imagine if eBay's down for 90 minutes? What happens in 90 minutes on eBay? All them auctions just close, so the person who bet a dollar initially and know how people wait to the last minute to make their bids, and I, you know, can you just imagine the issues that would cause? So it, it's tough. Well, our network here at Rose State went down, what, yesterday, I think? or Yeah, it was yesterday. Shalon just showed up, come to work to grade something. It was amazing. She just shows up, network goes down. So I'm thinking she caused it. I, know, I was just, just thinking. But, no. but our network went down. So how much work can we get done when the network goes down? I'm here to grade. Huh, get grades. I guess I'm going to go home. It's only down for, like, 10 minutes, but still it was down. Okay, so that's all big issue. Is this a video? No, it's a picture. Okay, great. I'm glad they gave us a picture of a news newsman. Okay. All right. Social engineering says any act of manipulating a person who's performing actions or divulging confidential information. Okay. Um, uh, Kevin Mitnick, some of you might have heard the name. If you want to read some good books that are very cheap, there's two books called Hackers and Crypto. Did I already tell you guys about this? Okay, one's called Hackers, the other's called Crypto. I'll even show them to you. Let me show them to you. Hackers from Stephen Levy. Okay, you probably see a picture of the book. Now, there it is. Now, there's Stephen Levy. This is book Hackers. Excellent book. It starts off about MIT, their model training club, and how they got into all their computers. And there's another one called Crypto made by the same guy. You can buy them on Amazon, including shipping, for under $5. So they're really, really interesting. Talk about how the entire computer evolution got started. There's also a bunch of videos out there about Kevin Mitnick, where he started exploiting people. And there's a whole bunch of Discovery Channel. So if you go on YouTube, search for Kevin Mitnick, like Discovery Channel, see if we can find one. YouTube. Come on, you can do it. Ah, come on. There's a documentary on Kevin Mitnick. Come on. Okay. Well, where's the documentary? There, well, there's a CNN interview. But just search for Kevin Mitnick, and there's, I think it was on Discovery Channel. It's an awesome video. Yeah, there's some, but yeah, there it is. This is actually that's Kenny. The, it was just start for Kevin Mitnick in documentaries. It's really he was one of the first people behind social engineering. 
he started this where the, you can you dial a half? He would pit, tell people to dial like you know two o three and a half. People are like, huh? How do you dial a half? So that's that's what he's known for. We actually wanted to bring him here to Rose State to talk to our students. He charges fifteen thousand to talk plus all expenses. I'm like, dude, I really have zero money, so it's not going to happen. The social engineering, manipulating a person into performing actions or divulging confidential information. Did you ever notice, you know, um, okay, a prime example. This last week, I got a notification from HR, or Human Resources Building, saying that I had to go and fill out a release of work. So I'm teaching for you guys on Saturday. Now they're paying me differently this year. So I had to go fill out a release of work to teach for you guys, okay? So I'm in order to fill it out, and the forum talks about, you know, drug tests and all this other stuff that they're like, oh, we know you. Check, 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 check. I didn't have to do any of it. So is that good or bad? Well, I've been working here for 15 years. I'm a full-time employee, so I can understand why they do that. But how do they know I'm not using drugs right now? They had a prime, exam a prime way of testing me for drugs, and they didn't do it. I didn't do drugs, by the way. I don't believe in it. But I'm just saying, just for the fact that they knew me, they skipped it. I can walk over the cashier's case to pick up a check, and I say I'm here to pick up a check for Ken Dewey, and they hand it to me. How do they know I'm Ken Dewey from anybody? Okay. We had a bunch of students who did a project on campus. Their goal was to break into the school. So we had a student who actually now works for IT services, but if he didn't, he didn't. At the time, he didn't. He went over to student services, say, hey, I'm John from IT services. I'm here to fix your computer. And they're like, oh, okay. And he's like, can you log in for me? Say, logged in and left him there. Uh, a stu another student walked over to student services and say, yeah, my name's Eileen Dewey, my ex-wife's name. My name's Eileen Dewey, and I lost my faculty ID card. I, oh, here, have a seat. Took a picture of the student, put it on a faculty ID card, and handed it to the student. That student left. And, and the funny thing was no one knew what was happening, except for the president. He's the only one on campus that knew what was happening. And the guy who went over and told him he was from IT services, person actually, once they logged him in and left, they actually called IT services. Hey, you got someone over here? They're like, no, they actually called the cops. They're like, whoa, whoa, stop, stop, stop. You know, it was, I mean, it was, it was, we got an email saying, hey, there's a malicious student going around campus, blah, blah, blah. So he said, stop, 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 stop. Yeah. Because the president knew about it. We didn't want anyone else to know about it because, you know, then they'd be looking. But it's amazing what you can get away with nowadays. Um, not really social engineering, but kind of along the same lines. Um, Will Rogers Airport, I'm assuming someone's been through the airport before, some of us. Well, uh, my son went on that trip with high school, that EFT trip to Europe. They pay tons of money and they learn nothing except how to drink beer. Um, my son was coming back at midnight. So we're waiting for my son to come back. We're waiting outside the secure area right there by the stairwell. We're waiting there, and we see a guy cleaning the – you know how many walk out of the gates area? He got that little walkway, and there's a guard standing there looking this way, and you walk past him. Well, there was a guy sweeping, and he dropped something, and then he walked past the guard sweeping, okay? Then he turned around and realized he dropped something behind the guard, you know, inside the secure area. So what do you think? Should the guard let him go pick it up? He did it. I was very impressed. Security says, I'm sorry, you've crossed this line. You must go through all the way through security again. So the cleaning guy had to walk all the way back through, get all x-rayed and all over again, just to pick up the thing he dropped 20 feet away, which was actually good. He passed the line, even though they knew, but still, where do you cross the line? Well, okay, if it's only five feet away, you can go pick it up. Well, maybe only six feet away, or maybe only 20 feet away. The rule said, you cross this line, that's it, you don't go back, which I was so impressed. I'm like, I, could, I would really expect them to say, okay, I saw you drop it, you go pick it up, but they didn't. So, all right. Oh, I can't change my slide. All right. So types. We can have physical social engineering, face-to-face. -face. Maybe I'm talking to you. I'm going to be a friend of mine. Uh, it's not really social engineering, but I like going into stores. Like, remember we had Anthony's here? Anyone remember Anthony's clothing store? I would love going into Anthony's to buy something. And I would say, hey, do you have like a 50% off coupon or some sort of coupon? I did that one day, and the lady goes, actually, I do, right here. Would you like it? I'm like, sweet. got half off my order. I went and got my iPhone yesterday and told the guy, hey, come on, is there any kind of like discount I can get? He's like, well, I can only give you a $30 discount. 
sweet, give me a $30 discount. But I walked in there with no discount. He goes, I can only discount it by 30 bucks. I'm like, sweet. If you don't ask, I'm not going to give it to you. Whenever I buy a car, whenever I go to financing, I always say, hey, um, you can throw on some free window tinting? Oh, no. I said, well, I guess the deal's off. Trust me, they will throw on the free window tinting <laughs> every time. But face-to-face, -face, we could also have shoulder surfing. Maybe I'm watching around, watching what you're typing. Could be piggybacking or tailgating. I take care of a gym over here on Sooner Road. They have a deal where you put a fob up by the door, it unlocks it, then you walk through. Well, the tailgate system, there's a sensor that detects someone walking through there. It's disabled for four seconds. So basically, it's just time to walk to the door. They do that to prevent you letting 12 of your buddies come in the gym with you. Okay? Or dumpster diving, going through the trash. A good, a good uh, exercise to do with dumpster diving might sound kind of weird, but if your trash day is on Monday, Sunday night, go through your own trash. Dump it out. See what you are throwing away. It could be credit card applications. There could be all kinds of information in there. What could I do if I got a hold of your trash? What would I find in there? I have a shredder at home. I shred everything. And an easy way to get a free shredder, <clears throat> it's really awesome plan, go to... Office Depot where someone buy like a hundred dollar shredder. Okay? Take it home. Now this normally doesn't work for kids, it normally works for husbands, sorry. Take it home as a husband, start shredding all those flyers your wife gets in the mail. I did it with my ex-wife one day. She had a pair of jeans she was gonna buy. And she goes, Don't throw this way, I'm gonna buy these jeans. I accidentally shredded it. She said, like, I was going to buy those jeans. They're only 60 bucks. I'm like, I just saved $60, paid for the shredder. So <laughs> I shred all kinds of stuff. Okay. Okay, it could be phishing. Maybe through an email that says, I'm from Nigeria. I got $500 billion for you. So, okay. Or telecommunications. Phishing, that's like voice over IP type stuff. Maybe they're listening in on your phone call. There's a program called Kane, C-A-I-N, which I could run on this PC and capture every single phone call made on that phone. Totally free. Okay. All right. So, did I went the wrong way again. I don't know which arrow. It's too hard to figure out. Okay. So, physical to impersonate someone who's likely to be trusted. This could be someone from your organization, an emergency responder, the pizza delivery guy. How do you know who they are? You don't. Okay. There's a DEF CON video. DEF CON is the fence competition in Vegas. There's a DEF CON video from like a year ago where a guy was talking about all the different ways you could social engineer people, you know, the stuff he would do. I mean, you can go online, you can buy a FedEx shirt and a FedEx hat and a FedEx jacket. You can buy them anywhere. Now I can walk right up to you with a box. I'm here from FedEx. You don't think they're going to let me in through the security? You know, yesterday when I was at the Apple store or the AT&T store, FedEx drove up. With a big old cart full of iPhone boxes. Okay? He walked right in the front door with the cart. They let him right in the back room of the ATT store. Did they check his ID? No. They showed him in a FedEx truck and a FedEx jacket on. Was he really FedEx? He probably was. But what if he wasn't? Okay? So, impersonate someone who's likely to be trusted. All right. Shoulder surfing is using direct observation, looking over someone's shoulder like Roy does whenever I type my password. Okay, <laughs> It's an effective way to get information in crowded places because it's relatively hard. Uh, one thing I'm very impressed with, and I fly all the time from this place, Oklahoma City Airport. You know how they got the doors going out to the planes? Once you're at the gate area, you got that last door. For the longest time, they just walk up and enter a code. And you can stand there and watch them. But now... Every time I watch it now, they got a little metal shield around it, and they walk up and they cover it with their body so you can't see it. Is that, is that better? Heck yes, that's better. So I'm very impressed. I always watch that stuff to see if I can see what they're doing. I was at Huderberg Toyota last week getting my oil changed, and I guess they changed their software. And the lady, I guess that was checking out or something, she's like, oh, this darn software keeps logging me off. So she grabs a piece of paper sitting there on the desk, and looks up her username and password and logs in again. But it's right in front of me. I could have sat there and wrote it all down, come back after hours, and got right into Hudeberg's network. I'm willing to bet some of that information on that page would have allowed me to get in remotely. So, all right. <clears throat> Piggybacking or tailgating. This is a person tags along behind another person who's authorized. You see it a lot on movies where people walk up to apartments, follow, you know, push the buttons until someone opens, and they just walk on in. That can happen quite easily. 
Okay, like we have a biometric lock down in our door, down in room two hundred one. If I I can open it with my fingerprint, but is it really going to prevent someone from walking in behind me? No. All right. All right. Also, physical dumpster side is looking for for treasures in someone else's trash. Okay, look through it, find all kinds of stuff. We had students who who did this as a project in a class and brought back a whole bunch of papers from Express Personnel. They're a staffing agency, the temp agencies. Brought back a big old pile of timesheets. So I called them up and I called the corporate number. And I'm like, sir, that cannot be true. We have a shredding policy here at Express Personnel. I'm like, how can I prove to you they're real? She goes, okay. Up in the top right hand corner, there'll be a number. So I read off the number. She's like, where did you find those? I'm like, I don't know. A student got them for me. She goes, those are from corporate. Those are the corporate time cards that they just threw in the trash can. Had the name, social security numbers, everything on it. So I said, obviously, your corporate shredding policy is not the best. Uh, I was actually speaking at a, on Tinker over at the Tinker Business Industrial Park. I was talking about a student who went through uh, outside of an insurance agency and brought all this stuff, and we were showing pictures of it on the screen. We just happened to have a senator in the audience, which I didn't realize at the time. And it turns out he owns an insurance company. And it wasn't the same branch office, but it was one of the same company. And he wasn't very pleased. But it happens. It happens. Uh, we had uh, students back in 2004. Y'all got, I'm assuming some of you have a driver's license. You know, the new pretty driver's license with all the colors and everything on it? Well, they had an issue with driver's license. Some were getting stolen. So they had students go through the trash cans up in Tulsa. And they actually did this over Thanksgiving weekend. Each student was assigned a different tag agency in Tulsa to get the trash. It was all sanctioned by the police. They wanted to see what was going on. We brought the trash back to my house. We went through it, and there was really nothing in it except a whole bunch of cellophane ribbon. Well, those printers that they print the driver's licenses on had blue, red, and yellow ribbon. And when they print your driver's they throw the ribbon in the trash. Well, you hold the ribbon up to a light, you have an exact image of the driver's license in three colors. So they're like, oh, my God, they didn't even think about that. They were just throwing the ribbons in the trash can. That not only one, but you actually had every driver's license number that was printed on that piece of ribbon. So I'm assuming that's been fixed by now. But it's just something, you know, we went to a nice, secure driver's license, but the policy of disposing of it, people didn't even think of. Okay? It says, seamlessly innocent information such as a phone list, calendar, organizational chart can be used. A lot of information there. Okay. Oh, I went the wrong way again. Okay. Hold on. I don't know how I keep skipping back and forth. Well, here we go. All right. Phishing. It's a phishing is email fraud, which we all get. Uh, we all get the one from Nigeria. I actually got a phishing attempt through fax the other day. I've never got one through fax before, but I actually got one through fax. Where they say, you know what, you're going to get some money, call us or do something. I like emailing them back and replying to them, hoping I can get some rapport going with them to drive them crazy, but it doesn't normally work. I have a, uh, a video series actually down in my office to catch a predator from Dateline. It was awesome. It's like five or six hours. If you want it, I can give you a copy of it, which goes all into this. It's about the whole Nigerian scam. They actually track some stuff all the way to Nigeria. It's really, with Wendy, it's really kind of interesting. It's off dateline. Okay. Vishing, voice over IP phishing. In other words, using your voice over IP phones. Okay. So, a lot of people have it now. Or it could also be on your cell phone. You can actually install apps on your cell phone now to cause issues. So, a lot of issues there. Okay. How valuable is it? Well, we can have access to your network with usernames and passwords. We could have physical access to a data center. Is that, do they actually lock the doors? Okay. Could be spoof or email, known vulnerabilities, all kinds of different stuff. How, what do you think the value would be for a, the code to this door? Is there any value in that? Well, let's see. The school is open seven days a week because the library is open. But what if I was a bad guy and wanted to sell that code to somebody? They could walk through here, grab all these computers on a Sunday, run out that door, and we'll never know anything about it. Now, we do have cameras, but the cameras record everything. And you know, we actually had someone, uh, we were having a, a meeting a couple years back now on a Friday night. While we were at the meeting, someone came in downstairs. We had a 42-inch LCD TV on the wall, cut the locks off it, stole the TV, and ran out of the building. No one ever caught them. The locks, the cameras happened to be off on that day. So fun stuff. Okay, but 
How about an email address? Is there any value in an email address? What if I send out spam or whatever, a phishing attempt to a million people and only one response? Hey, it's awesome. It doesn't cost me anything to send them out. If I can get one person to respond and maybe I can get thousands of dollars from them, heck yes, it's valuable. All right? Okay, top 10 threats. Malware, we talked about that. Insiders. I would say that is probably the, the biggest one. Insiders. Maybe I'm working for Walmart. One for Walmart, one for me. One for Walmart, one for me. Okay? Okay, exploited vulnerabilities. We talked about those. Careless employees. Forget to log off their computer. Forget to lock the door. Mobile devices. We all have cell phones in here, don't we? Okay. That's another issue. Okay. Social networking. Social engineering. You know, social networking. Everybody has a Facebook page. What do you put on there? Some people, like Manise, puts her entire life history, including all her contact information, everything out there. Not necessarily a good idea. Okay. The new Google Plus app for your mobile device, by default, uploads every picture you've ever taken on your phone up to their server. It doesn't share it. But it does upload them all there. Did, do I want that to happen? No, I don't want that. I don't want to upload pictures as I tell them to. So you got to go ahead and turn that off. Okay. We talked about zero-day exploits. That's we found a vulnerability. They just haven't had time to fix it. All right. Cloud computing. Man, we all. I'm assuming a lot of us have Gmail, Yahoo, that kind of stuff. So we're using the cloud for our email or file storage now. Heck, I'm posting these videos on YouTube. Same thing. Okay. All right. Cyber espionage. You know, people break in through computers. Okay. How to protect yourself. Keep it updated by patching. Okay. Windows updates, you need to do those. For the competition, download the service packs, install those, update all your patches, that kind of stuff. Use anti spyware software, malware bytes, right there. The first one on the list. Get it. Know how to use it. It's awesome. We use it. Use it today. I, I mean, I, we use it right now. I mean, this time, it's not old. It's awesome. It's updated all the time. Okay. There's also a spy bot service and destroy. So here's some different software you can use. Okay. Use a firewall. Let's actually look at a firewall. Let me see if it's on our server here. Let me see if I got a firewall on my server. I haven't looked yet, so I might, might not. I'm not sure. Let's see. If it is, then we'll go look at one real quick. So we have, come on. All right, yeah, everybody go into your server. Let's look at a firewall. We haven't played with the firewalls yet. Go inside your server 2003, which is probably still running from before. Click on Start. Go into Control Panel. Now let's look at the firewall. Oh, click the three blocks at the top, the Control Delete thing at the top, third icon from the right, Well, and then just... Say okay because there's no password unless you put a password on it. Okay. okay yeah. so then, then click on start, control panel, and then firewalls at the bottom. Windows firewalls at the bottom. Okay, start control panel, then Windows firewall. Okay. It won't let me run it. Ah. Do you want to start it? Yes. Start the service. There you go. Just say yes. Okay. So the service was not started. Was that a good thing? Probably not. <laughs> but yeah, when, I, when Andrew made these, I made, told them to make them quite unsecure. All right, so now we have the firewall. It's turned off right now. Is that good or bad? It's bad. It's very bad. Okay? So we could turn it on. I'm going to click the on button right here. I'm going to click on. Now, I know we mentioned this before, but we didn't actually do it. So let's talk about this again. I have an option here for don't allow exceptions. Well, let's talk about what the exceptions are. Under the Exceptions tab, here's things like file and printer sharing. Now, if I'm a file server and I need to share files, obviously I need to be able to have that. So I could check this. Now what's, I'm going to add an exception in my firewall to allow file and printer sharing. Okay? So if they give you a server or something that you have to be able to share files, which you will, make sure you allow that. Because if you disable that, they're not sharing nothing. Okay? But if I go over here to the general tab and I click no exceptions, it's not going to happen. It says, select this will connect to a public network and less secure options such as airports when you're connected to one that's unsecure. 
So you'll be notified by Windows Firewall Blocks program. So the exceptions tab will be ignored. So if I click this button, do not allow exceptions, then anything here is going to be ignored. So if you are to be a file surfer, don't click this. Do not click the don't allow exceptions. But unless they tell you you're a file server, a mail server, or whatever, I recommend checking. But I know for a fact in the last two years, they've, they always had to be some sort of file server, mail server, or something. Okay? So if you have to be something, actually, I think the first round, you're nothing. You're just a standalone PC. Fire rent. In that case, don't allow exceptions. But once they tell you you have to do something, uncheck that, go to the exceptions area, and allow in whatever. Now, what if they tell you mean you have to be a mail server? Can my mail server work right now? No. But you can always add more. You can add a program. I can go through and find the program I need to allow. Or I can add a port. Does anyone have a clue what port email uses? Lower. Uh, what's email use? Starts with a 2 and a 5. 25. Very good. All right. Okay, email. Email sends out on port 25. So they tell me I need to be an email server. There you go. Now I can send email. Okay. If I'm going to be a web server, okay, maybe I'm going to be what? What port is a web server? Come on. What port does it surf in the web use? Starts with 80. Very good. 80. All right. Okay. So. Web server, port 80. I think we actually talked about these on one of the prior slides. It was a bunch of lists of common ports. Pretty sure that was, we went over that, didn't we? If we didn't, you need to know them. Uh, they will be on one of the presentations. They're always on one of them. But if you go on Google here and you type in common TCP ports, I spelled common wrong. Okay, list of TCP and UDP port numbers. I bet there's a whole bunch of. Them. Well, here's here's the. Well, come on, slow. One of these links will have them for you. There we go. Here's a bunch of port numbers. So godly slow to load, but they're all here. So all I did was type in common TCP ports. Okay. Very simple to do. And here's the most common ones, so just a bunch of them. Okay, port 20. So emails, 25. Oh, look, simple SMTP's email. Port 80 was for surfing the web. So I did was typed in common TCP ports. TCP is the protocol. All right? So if I want to be a web server, now I'm, I can be a file printer server. I can be an email and a web server. Because if they tell you to be one, and you don't allow it through, it ain't going to work. So I don't know if we ever looked at this in the past years. But if they tell you to be a web server, an email server, or a whatever, make sure you allow it through your firewall. Don't just turn your firewall off. So when you do that, make sure you do not check exceptions, because you want exceptions. You still want the firewall on, but you want all this stuff right here, all these exceptions to work. Everybody with me? Yes, no? Getting all this? All right. There is advanced where I can do different things for different network cards, different protocols like ICMP. You can also restore defaults. I don't think you'll need to mess with that at all. The only thing that might be an issue is since you are using VMware, you might have more than one network connection. If you do, you might have to connect. You know, There might be more than one listed at the top. Then just check them both. Is everyone okay on how to add an exception in your firewall? Okay. So firewall's still on, but we're letting a few things through. Okay. There you go. All right, so we fixed that. So, so we use the firewall. Now, there's a lot of other firewalls out there, but use the free one. And it comes with Windows. All right. So continue on. How to use an antivirus program. Look at all these free ones. AVG, Avast, Security Essentials, Komodo Antivirus, that's a new one, a Viral, Panda, Immune, Digital Defender, PC Tools, they're all free. So only use the free ones. I recommend for, 
I recommend Microsoft Security Essentials. I use it for everything. I use it in my house. I use it in my office. I use it everywhere. Okay. Now Linux, Linux. There's a uh, Clam and a couple other ones as well. But you can always type in free and ours. Are we okay on that? All right. It's hard to know which ones are are not malware. Well, I mean, it, I mean, clearly these slides came from Cyber Patriot, so these have some. Right. right. But a lot of other times you don't know, like the Windows Antivirus Pro, whatever. So it's hard to know which ones are reputable, free, and which right. ones are malware. I do take, okay, Avast is okay, but the problem with Avast and AVG, stuff like that, they're free. A limited edition's free. But they're always like, hey, you know what, I could add this for $29, or I could do this if you pay me for it. You're sure you want to upgrade to the pro version? And you have to keep saying no. Microsoft is free forever. That's it. It's free. Done. Works great. Doesn't cost you nothing. But it will not work on real old copies of Windows. I'm not sure if it will work on XP. Not one of them positive. But try it. But if you need one for your house, I'm telling you, Microsoft is my absolute favorite right now. I even have free access to McAfee and I don't even use it. All right. So I'll be okay on antivirus. Okay. Check your files. This is Windows. Check task managers. Or exer uh, examine the exe files that are running. So we're going to go in our machine here. We're going to right click and go to task manager. We're going to see what's running. We'll look at these processes. What are all these things? Maybe they're a bad file, something or other. You know. Look at it. If you're not sure, go search them on the internet. Okay. So examine them. It says check task manager or, or go process modern, which is even better. Okay. Check startup. Okay. Let's see how to do that. Okay. So I'm going to click over here. And I'm going to go to start all programs startup. It's empty. That's good. But maybe it's not empty. Maybe there's something in there. Okay. Start program startup. Make sure there's nothing in there. Another one you can run. Let me see if it works on this one. Yes. Okay. Another thing you can do, you can click Start Run, then type excuse me, MS Config, M-S-C-O-N-F-I-G, MS Config, stands for Microsoft Configuration. Okay. MS Config. So I want a normal startup. I can look at the different things and see what's loading. Okay. I can see what services are. Aha! Under startup, I got something in there. I got VMware tools. So is that a good or bad thing? Probably okay since we're running VMware. But if I went in there and I saw Super Anti Spire 2012, it's probably a bad thing. Yes, sir. Uh, services host. Um, it's normally a host that runs other processes. Okay. And Process Explorer, if you open up Process Explorer, it'll actually tell you which process or which DLL that's actually running. It stands for services host. Okay. So MS Config is a good place to look. There's another place to look. I'll show you how to get here, but you probably won't remember. But start run, type reg edit, R E G E D I T. R E G E D I T. Start run, R E G E D I T. E D I T stands for Registry Editor. In my head, <laughs> yeah, there's actually a lot of places. I mean, they might even show it on the slides. Okay, they might. But I'm inside the registry. Don't screw this stuff up in here. If you screw something up in here, you could kill your machine. Just saying. Okay. Now, there's two places in here you want to look. Two places. All right. I'm going to get down to local machine. And I got this is the Windows registry. This is the brains and the heart of Windows. So I'm going to expand local machine, H key local machine. I'm going to expand software. I'm going to expand Microsoft. Then I'm going to click W and I'm going to get down to Windows. I'm going to expand Windows. Then current version. 
and then run and run once. Okay. I know you can't really see this so well. Let me see if I can't zoom in here real quick so you can see it. Okay. I'm inside of HKey Local Machine, software, Microsoft, Windows, current version, run. This is where all the stuff, this is where you'll find most of your viruses. If something is set to automatically start, here's where it'll be. Okay? Again, HK Local Machine, Software, Microsoft Windows, current version, then run. All right? Now, say I find this in here and I don't want it. Let me move this down a little. I can just delete it. But... I don't recommend it. Let me show you why. If I delete this, I won't be able to put it back in because I don't know it. But if I if I click on this and if I go File, Export, I can actually save it like uh, Export 1 or 1. Okay. And now I just saved it out in case I accidentally delete it. Now I can delete it. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. So now I can always go back in here, file, import. I can import that one I just accidentally deleted. There it is. So I recommend file export, whatever you want to take out of there in case you screw it up. Because then you can always do file import to get it back in again. All right? You okay with that? Look what's in here. Normally you don't want anything in here. Now once you install your antivirus, it's going to put stuff in here. It's going to put some stuff from Microsoft Security Essentials and a couple other things. All right, next place to look. Underneath run, there's run once. Underneath run, you'll find run once. Okay? What that is, sometimes stuff gets installed, but it says, okay, I will finish upon next reboot. That's where it would be. It'll run it one time, then it'll delete it. But a virus could be in there as well. It could be set up to run the next time you reboot only. So maybe you clicked on something and infected yourself today. But you're not really infected yet. I mean, you did, but once you reboot, the next day it's going to be under run once, so it runs it the next time you reboot, and then now you're infected. Okay? All right. So those, run and run once. Now, one other place to look. Go all the way back to the beginning. You hit the left arrow. You go all the way back to the beginning. Do the same thing, except this time under current user. So software... Under current user, go to software, Microsoft Windows, current version, run. Again, software, under current user, software, Microsoft Windows, current version, run. And that's under the current user. It'll see what's running in there as well. There's also a run once in there. So check those two places. All right? If you screw it up, could have some issues. So I say export first, then delete. Then you can always put them back in. But don't delete anything about Cyber Nexus or anything like that. All right? That's in the registry editor. Very careful in here. If you do the wrong thing, your machine's going to die. All right? So let's see. All right. We, we talked about, okay, monitor DLL changes. Windows actually has a capability in it to monitor DLL changes, which are nice. But you... What? DLL is a dynamic link library. It's what makes Windows run. It's the underlying components. Now, if I was to look at a DLL on my machine, let me go into my machine here, and let me zoom out so you can see my whole screen. If I start search, let me do everything.dll. Whole bunches of them. Lots and lots of them. All right. Now, if I look over here, look at the date of those files. They're all from March 22nd, 2006. Now, what if I looked at one of those and was dated today? It's probably a virus. Something just got installed. So look at your stuff. And then, hey, if there's some brand new files, Windows does write files every day. But your dynamic link libraries aren't normally written every day, usually on update and stuff like that. So all these are old. And I can sort by the date. Okay, I got some from 2003. I got some 
Wow, some from this year. Well, if you look, those are all from VMware and the programs we installed. VMware, 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 VMware. Okay? So just look at that stuff. Okay? Unix, check the cron job. We haven't got to Unix yet. Um, I'm hoping your first machine is not Unix because we haven't got there yet. Um, we'll let Shalon cover all about Unix next week. She's like, oh, no. <laughs> but uh, we, we do have some Unix machines to play with, and Andrew's going to be here too. So, Okay, check your cron job. Okay, uh, monitor open ports. There's some free tools for those. Okay, Wireshark, which we haven't installed yet. We've run out of time today. But Wireshark is a tool you can see if anything's happening on your machine. Awesome tool if you've never played with it. Okay. So the Trojan Horse scanners typically attempt connections at high number of ports. So if I was to bring up something here, wireshark.org, wireshark.org, there it is. I can download it. It's free. I could run that. It's not hard to figure out. You can figure it out. Then you can look and see if there's something connecting to your machine. Again, the CyberNexus user will be connecting, so don't freak out about that. Okay. Stay up to date with the latest vulnerabilities. Okay. You can go to the CERTS website. There's also another website. It's um, I don't know. Security Wizard. I think it's securitywizardry.org or something. Let's see. Let me find it here. Oh, securitywizardry.com. The name sounds weird. But under Security Wizardry, you can see a lot of the threats. It actually gives you a radar page. Okay, I'm going to go to the radar page. Yay. Come on, show me the radar page. This will show you some of the current vulnerabilities out there. It's always a nice, cool page. Where the threats are coming from, the latest tools available, tells you the security news. Come on, there it goes. Here's the latest vulnerabilities. I mean, this is real time stuff. Okay. So, Microsoft Internet Explorer, multiple user after free bugs let remote users execute arbitrary code exploit. It's kind of a cool place to look at. Okay. So, that's securitywizardry.org. Okay. Almost done with this because it's almost time to go home. How to protect yourself. Obviously, get training. You're doing that. Always verify who you're speaking with. Don't just talk to anybody. Okay. Never give out sensitive information over the phone or email. Okay. Verify websites with secure. That's in other words, make sure there's a lock up in the corner before you start putting personal information in there. Do not let anyone with proper without proper ID escort them to security to get a new one. So basically, if someone's around, doesn't have an ID, our IT services now all have badges on that say they're from IT services. You should always do that. Make sure no one is looking over your shoulder when you're typing usernames and passwords. Also, it says use your hand to shield anyone's view of your pins when you're entering an ATM. Okay. Almost done. Okay. Here's some more antivirus. These are not free, but there's good information there. So you can find out more information. There's more stuff there, and how stuff works is also good about computers. So. All right. Almost done. All right. There's US CERT, a lot of good information there. FBI has a lot of good information. Semantic has good information. There's social engineering task force. There's just all kinds of stuff you can learn. Okay. All right. Now that's the end of our threats lecture. Okay. We're still not done. I you know Shalon's gonna cover some next week, but you guys got practice around coming up, don't you? Like two weeks or something? Two weeks. It wouldn't hurt you to start looking over some of this other stuff that we haven't got to yet. But next week, we're going to have a machine for you to use that has some vulnerabilities, kind of like a trial run. But you all be able to take home with you, so bring a flash drive if you want to take it with you. And you can log in, and Andrew and Shalon will be doing that for you. Okay? So she's going to do number seven? She'll probably start on five. That's where we're at now. Okay. Yeah. So five, six, and seven? Hopefully. Six, six. Is that the plan? Um, I don't know how far she's going to get next week because I know next week you're all going to be going through the machine with the vulnerabilities in it. She wants to give you some time to find the vulnerabilities. Okay. But we have more training before the first actual competition round. It's in October sometime. Okay. All right. So, okay. So
So we'll start on five, yep. and you're going to make seven. Yep. Let me stop this recording. Okay, everybody, you can go home now. Uh, Roy, you can stop.